here. Uh, this feels kind of like a church. So if uh, everyone in the back, couple of pews, want to come up, I'd appreciate it. If not, totally cool. Um, so my name is Kevin McCarthy, and I'm a co-founder and CTO at Streetwise Media, which is a Boston-based company that was started. Uh, me and my co-founder, I've just been doing media companies for years now, um, since college. And uh, Streetwise Media runs uh, two properties. Boston, which is a local publication covering a lot of tech and innovation in the city, and In the Capital, which we just launched in February. Um, so as I, uh, a little bit more background information, um, we have about 10 full-time editorial staff. So that's uh, seven in Boston and three in DC. Um, we have four full-time developers, myself included. And we have 300 organizations in the area publishing directly to the platform um, using a, like a mini WordPress on the front end. So they've got user management, post management, they can design uh, and tweak some of the visuals of their channel. And uh, just in June, we hit um, 1.4 million uniques. Um, I'd say all this because uh, it'll help frame a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, which is how we use Git, GitHub uh, for speed and ease of development, as well as talk a little bit about some uh, hacks that we do to optimize uh, WordPress, get the most of that. Um, so, a little bit about our WordPress installation. Uh, it's a WordPress multi-site installation, version 3.4.1, which we just uploaded or I think we made the switch sometime late last week. Um, pretty standard LAMP stack, nothing too crazy going on. Um, the machine itself, both sites are hosted on the same box. Uh, the database is on the same box. We've got 10 gigs of RAM and two CPUs. And um, we have about 15,000 published posts. And that's increasing at about 300 per week. And that 300 becomes 305, 10, 15 uh, as it progresses. So the database is getting quite large. And we've got a lot of going on, not just our own editorial, but not only just the readers, but also the channel partners as well. So, um, when we were first uh, thinking about <coughs> version control, how many people here use GitHub or Subversion? Cool, so does anyone uh, want to know a little bit more about version control in general? Does anyone have any questions on that? Cool. Um, so basically, the question we asked ourselves are we going to go with Git or are we going to go with Subversion? Um, and for these four reasons, which I'll talk about each in a little bit more depth, uh, we ended up going with Git. First, Git is just much faster than Subversion. We, um, on a previous project, I used Subversion and uh, recloning a branch or pulling in new code could take anywhere up from 30 to 45 seconds. And that's not a big deal if it's downtime or whatever, but uh, with a lot of people always on the site, really couldn't have funky behavior. Um, that same process takes about two or three seconds with Git, so it's much, much faster. The uh, second reason we went with Git is GitHub and its interface. Um, it is just fantastic for looking at uh, branch diffs, uh, what the commits look like, who made the commit. I mean, you can all do this all with Subversion, um, but uh, a lot of it is terminal based and looking at diffs in the terminal is a little, can be strenuous. Um, so the GitHub interface was a big plus. Uh, also, GitHub's uh, user access was very big for us. We have four full-time developers and they have full pull and push access. Now, if an intern comes in, and they're only gonna be there for three months, don't wanna give them access to pull and maybe corrupt the master branch or whatever. So what we end up doing is just giving them access to pull down the code, and when it comes time to push, we have a buddy edit system, and then the push is done that way. Um, the other reason why we went with Git is GitHub's integration with other platforms. Um, the development team, we all use Campfire to stay out and chat. Does everyone know what Campfire is? Campfire is a chatting platform designed by 37 signals. Um, and 
It's just, it's really stupid easy. It's literally just a chat. I think you can upload files, but rarely do we. Um, what's nice about uh, Campfire and GitHub is that you can actually integrate um, commits and pull requests into the GitHub chat. So someone's working away, you're all in the chat room, and then you hear an alert, you look onto uh, Campfire, and it says, developer X has just committed blah, 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 with a hyperlink to GitHub so you can see what everyone's working on in real time. It comes in great um, when we're working remotely or something. Because, uh, you know, you could, what we used to do is just send an email, hey, take a look at this commit before we want to go live with it. And that was just inefficient. Sometimes emails get lost. Some people just don't get to their emails till later in the day. Uh, integration with GitHub and Campfire has been uh, fantastic. Um, the next big thing we wanted to talk about was how we were going to put Git and GitHub with our WordPress installation. Um, the first thought we had was making everything in the root directory under version control. That means the core files, WP admin, WP includes, and everything in the root directory. Um, we eventually moved off of that idea simply because um, the time to reconfigure everything would have been a pain in the ass. So basically, if, you, if, a if we had everything under the root directory in version control, a developer clones out uh, the repository to make a new branch, maybe it's just a CSS tweak or whatever, he or she would have to update wp-config for their local environment to get it up and running. Um, and I know that we probably could have hacked uh, some of the stuff just to ignore certain files and certain directories like WP uploads or the uh, upload directory. But um, we eventually fe uh, felt there's no reason for any of that to be under version control, especially the core. Um, no reason anyone should be touching the core to begin with. Um, so what we ended up doing was finding and isolating the parts of the code base that we were touching all the time. That's plugins, must use plugins, and the themes directory. Um, so from when we first started with Git, we logged into the server, uh, and whatever it was on that server was considered master. We initialized a repository and sent it to GitHub, so now we had a layer in between the live site, GitHub, and now everyone could interact with GitHub and pull it down as needed. Um, it actually works out great. Um, <coughs> like I was saying, if it was just a small CSS tweak or something like that, there's really no reason to put the plugins branch under version control. Um, it's adding additional overhead when you didn't really need it. The only thing that's tricky, though, is when you have a full product launch, you got to make sure that the branch names are homogenous across the board. So we just launched a careers platform. Um, and all the naming conventions for all the repositories were careers underscore one data. Um, that is actually one of the larger pieces of advice I could give is make sure you know what branch you're working on and make them homogenous across the board. I can't tell you how many times there's been a bug that it was simply someone was on a wrong branch name in one of the repositories. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Uh, I kind of glanced over how um, each is a private re uh, repository. <coughs> Nothing? Bueller? <laughs> no, go um, through it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. go through yeah. it. Yeah. Detail, okay. please. Um, so then we also have types of branches. So let's say it is that tiny little CSS tweak. Uh, the padding on that widget needs to be a little bit better. What we'll do is create a hotfix branch where someone will create uh, offshoot a master, make the commit, um, open a pull request on GitHub so that everyone can see what's going on, and then merge and deploy to the live site uh, right away. What's uh, a hotfix has no peer editing. You're, the developer's taking at its word that it's good. Um, if it's requires any more configuration, it becomes a feature. Um, what's different about a feature branch is uh, it's buddy edited by another developer on the staff, 
end user tested by uh, a developer who wasn't the one who created the code or the one who reviewed the code so that they are completely fresh. And then a product branch was like that careers project, much bigger. It's uh, the entire team's reviewing the code um, and non-development is testing the product. We have user cycles, we've got our channel partners coming in, uh, and we have like a staff of 20 interns that just do this when we're ready for a product launch. Um, Quick question. Yep. Um, just when you're talking about launches and launching and builds, um, what's your review cycle? Is it just what's that? Do you do feature-based release cycles? No, we do um, two-week sprints. Um, we're, we're just getting into Kanban. Does everyone know what this is? We're just starting the board. Kanban is a... Japanese just in time? What's that? The Japanese just in time? I, I think it, that's what the origin of the word is. Um, basically what it is, it's a board cut into four. So you'll have... And each product or each product sprint, whatever, let's call it the career sprint, for example, um, has stories. And each story is a user should be able to do X. And that story goes into the tasks column of Kanban. Um, once, it's, uh, once that story has been assigned to somebody, it goes into the second column called to do. Hold on, let me just pull something up. It's actually easier if I uh, show it. Other questions while I'm uh, fixing this one up? When Anything about Git, GitHub? Yeah, when you talk about tools integration, yep. were there any um, Agile or Kanban tools that work well? Um, we haven't, uh, truth be told, we're kind of new to Kanban, um, but uh, I think Trello has some type of integration, and that's a big one that people are using. Um, for Kanban. We actually decided to go with this thing called Kanban Flow. Um, what's nice about Kanban Flow, if I can get there, um, is that it has a timing system, so once you start a task, you can click it and you have 25 minutes to complete it. And then the, it's a Polidoro technique where you take, you work for 25 and then you mentally check out for five. Um, not only is it good to keep focus, personally that's not how I work, but the other developers really seem to like it. Um, it's also good for future product uh, estimations. So now we know that uh, developer X, it took uh, him or her six hours to do whatever. Um, when something like that comes up again in the future, we can uh, readily estimate. K A N B A N. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. Um, yeah, you guys are probably just gonna have to Google that one on your own. Right, let's get back here. Yeah. No. But Kanban has been very. Uh, what we do is um, like a. <coughs> Friday afternoon, we uh, kind of talk about how the last sprint was and what we actually got done, what's residual, and then we start planning for the next one. Um, this is no time to lose the internet, I tell you. Um, we'll go over the stories, we'll outline them uh, with the product manager, whoever's got a say and <coughs> what features need to be in there and don't. Um, the benefit of the scrum and the two-week sprints is that it keeps everyone super focused. Um, and it also keeps the product scope in line. I can't tell you how many times before a Kanban or an Agile development method where we'd be building something, uh, someone has a request, a new feature, we'll bake it in, and now the project's out of scope and it's over deadline by weeks. Um, Kanban really keeps everything focused and uh, keeps the project online. A 
as opposed to my presentation, which has derailed. All right, I'm gonna have to just go this way. Sorry, guys. Um, so, with regards to multi-site, um, one of our goals, we've got these two sites all living on uh, multi-site WordPress. How did how do we develop everything once? We didn't want to, for that small CSS tweak, we didn't want to have to pop open two style sheets and edit them twice. It was just a waste of time. So what we ended up doing is um, using the blog ID uh, as a in the file name path. So let's say the active theme for both sites is called Streetwise. Um, instead of calling the same style sheet, you call one dynamically using the blog ID column. Um, so instead of CSS living in theme slash streetwise slash style.css, it would be theme slash streetwise slash blog ID one, two, three, four, whatever, slash style.css. Um, one of the other things about multi-site development that I'd like to impart is making everything configurable. Um, there's no need to, uh, it's a very little overhead to make something turn on or off or make something look a certain way. Um, if you don't make it configurable, you'll end up having like weird conditional clauses all in your code and it'll just be a nightmare to manage. Um, back to uh, saving development time is, we, have you guys ever heard of less.js? Yeah, we use it um, pretty extensively for our style sheets. I'm sure all of you guys have, like when you start developing a site, you have certain bricklets that you always like to use. I always like to call my wrapper class this. I always like to give it this kind of feature set. Um, and with only small variations, maybe it's a color thing, maybe it's a padding thing. Um, what's nice about less.js is that you can actually put in functions and variables into your CSS, I think they're called mixes. I'd have to talk to my front end guy about that. But, um, so instead of editing two style sheets, you plug in the variables into the less JS uh, style sheet, and then you run a Node.js compiler that knows where to make the changes uh, so that you only have to code it once. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's a, a big one here. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Again, hard to see because I don't have the internet. What uh, Wi-Fi are you guys using? Yes. Unencrypted? Yeah, it's unencrypted. Yeah. If you haven't used it, you have to restart. Yeah. Chrome? You don't want to do no, that. You have to restart your no, you, machine. If you, you shut off your Wi-Fi and shut it back on, it runs the short time. Oh, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about this, guys. Did not anticipate it. Anyway, um, um, does anyone have any questions or general issues? Yeah. Just a question about, you, you're talking about you leveraging the GitHub specific tools. Are, is your team using pull requests internally at all? Um, the question was, um, are we using pull requests internally? Meaning, um, like I've seen pull requests used as a way to track the development on a given feature within a branch, just so that there's an archive of what's been being developed. Yeah. It's something that I know GitHub uses internally. I'm curious to know whether that's a direction you guys have been looking. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the pull requests are great as an indicator of when something's ready to go into master. So that's basically what we use it for as that flag. Um, and in Campfire, you'll see commits flying in, but when a pull request comes in, everyone kind of stops and <coughs> takes a look at it. It's, uh, it's like a commit, but with more precedence. Uh, that's pretty much how we use it. Other platforms use it to, you know, like if uh, someone's got a new idea for a JavaScript plugin or whatever, um, 
they'll open a pull request with the actual developer to get their attention. Um, but yeah, we use it internally just as an indicator. Uh, this one's important. <coughs> Jeez. Um, any questions about Scrum or uh, Kanban? I think that could be um, uh, something that a lot of people would like to know more about. I have a question. Uh, yep. We use Kanban. We only just started using it um, where I work. And so we do post it on the wall. And our consultant who told us about it like, really discouraged us from doing um, an online version of it because we all were, like, we all work in the same place. And so you guys use it online? We do use online, but. Uh, it's a great point to have it visual on a board. I don't know what it is, but it it's I don't know. It just seems better. It works out better. Do you think the satisfaction moving the post-it from this category to another category? Yeah, yeah, that might be it. But like we uh we've got a the plan is to get one of those big monitors and just like right onto the wall so that we'll have the digital one there. I, it really loses the satisfaction value, but. Um, Something that everyone can see is probably pretty important as well. Um, all right, I'm going to reboot here and see if I can get back online. Um, but I will proceed uh, as planned. Um, so the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about outside of Git and GitHub was um, some MySQL optimizations. Um, everyone knows kind of like WordPress kind of drags on certain things. Um, <clears throat> some of the best parts of WordPress are that it's easy to use, but that inherently makes a little bit more overhead. Uh, so what we end up doing is really keeping an eye on what MySQL is doing. We ended up realizing that almost all of our slow page loads were due to too many queries uh, simultaneously or um, too much action going in there. Gee, this is just a botch job. <laughs> <laughs> the wireless here is really resistant. Yeah, it does not like me. <coughs> Do you want to try a mobile hotspot? I I have one on my uh, on my phone, but it just wasn't kicking for me. There's my local host. Anyone have any questions about Boston O in general? Anyone ever heard of it? Cool. You, could you go into detail? What's that? Yeah, tell us. Oh, okay. Um, so. Uh, me and my co-founder, we started a media company when we were in college called the Campus Word, where we had like 150 college journalists from uh, a whole bunch of different schools uh, submitting content regularly. And we were in college, it was like decent beer money. And uh, we were idealistic at the time where uh, this should be run by a student. So we turned it over to a student and he promptly ran it into the ground. Um, but. Uh, after that, we um, started this thing called Pinata, which is like a news aggregation service. Think Google Reader, um, but with some like social features and whatnot. Um, we did that for, um, we tried it as a consumer play, but now we use it internally for the editorial staff on keeping up what's going on on other publications and stuff like that. It's got some pretty cool semantic technology and that one's my baby, but we just got to figure out how to use it again. But um, the uh, so Boston you know, first started out at, in 2009, and we it was a tech block where we were covering tech and innovation here in the city, um, and it just started slowly growing and gaining steam. Um, and then in June of 2011, we caught seed series financing from some angels here in Boston and some uh, investment group uh, in Philadelphia um, to grow it out. Um, and since then, we've been, uh, we hired, I think there's 20 of us total, 16 of which are in Boston, and then the additional four are in DC for in the capital.
but yeah. Um, Um, all right, I'm going to have to go off script here. Um, so I was talking before about my sequel um, and how uh, we try to optimize it so that we're shaving page loads. Um, the first is that WordPress will ship, uh, will make any table, uh, whatever the standard MySQL one is. So in MySQL 5.1, which is probably what everyone's using here, um, WordPress, when it installs, will make everything the default table for MySQL 5.1. The default table is MyISO. And if you have a lot of reads and writes going to the WP post table, as you can imagine with a ton of editorial and, program, uh, and uh, channel partners uh, adding to the site, you can imagine that there's a lot of reads and writes. And MyISO, although fast for reads, will lock up. Um, it was causing a tremendous amount of drag. So, first thing we always do is uh, when we kick off a new site is we change the table from my ISAM to InnoDB. Gives you much more flexibility and uh, you never see that locking up issue. Um, so what you'll end up doing is altering the table for posts, post meta, terms, uh, terms relationships, uh, term taxonomy, user meta, user, pretty much everything, especially WP options and WP, whatever the blog ID is. Um, yeah, go nuts. Um, so yeah, I, I can't stress that one enough is changing it over to InnoDB. Um, another thing that we uh, unwittingly stumbled upon is that admin Ajax, you know WordPress tells you to use admin Ajax for all your Ajax requests. That, Anytime you call that, that's inherently 17 additional queries. So if you're calling it on page load, let's say you've got a widget that you're going to Ajax, it's not event based, it's on page load, you're essentially installing or calling the WordPress API twice and creating tons of overhead there. So my advice would be just to call admin Ajax only on event things where you can afford it. Um, the next thing with uh, MySQL queries is figuring out what your page is actually querying the database for. Um, I have a script that's on the internet right now um, that will loop through and show all of the queries that are running on your page. So I don't do this on a live one, so I'll save queries on my local host and then add this script to the bottom of my every page. Um, you'll see what's running, how long it takes to run, and then it'll also identify which is the longest of them all. Uh, this is great just to figure out what's going on. I can't tell you how many times this has saved us from uh, something running amok. You'll realize what the query problem is right away. Um, the other thing is uh, condensing the tables. Um, how, how often do you guys use uh, revisions and revision control in your WordPress post or your clients? Regularly, semi-regularly? If you look at your WP post table, you'll notice that there's a ton of revisions in there that are just creating unnecessary bloat. There's another script um, that'll delete revisions uh, from a configurable date. So every night I run a cron job that deletes revisions that are older than a week old, just so the tables is nice and clean. Um, there's bloat in other tables too. Obviously WP options is loaded, uh, auto-loaded on a bunch of different pages. Um, keeping that very small is very important. Um, you add a plugin, uh, then you deactivate it. What you'll notice is that those options might still be in WP options. You'll want to go through and filter those out so that table is as small as possible. There's other bloat in WP post meta, edit last lock and edit, uh, yeah, edit lock and edit last lock. Again, unnecessary if you really don't need them. I say you, you hack those out too. When, uh, when I get the internet back up running, I can share this script with all you guys and uh, <coughs> run with it. Um, next one, how many people use nav menus with WordPress? Do you, those are all stored in WP posts. So um, your nav menu almost never changes, right? You make one or two tweaks every once in a while and that's about it. Um, there's no reason why that shouldn't be hard-coded, 
because if it's in WP Post, you can cache that query anyway. You can say, give me the header menu uh, on each page load in the cache because WP Post is updated frequently. Did that make sense? I think I should go back and explain that more. So your nav menu, all in WP Post. Queries to WP Post are rarely cached if you're updating your posts regularly. So uh, that means that the queries to get your nav menu aren't going to be in the cache either. So the big thing there is to hard code the HTML and make sure you're not um, creating additional overhead by uh, querying something that is going to be the same on every page, fa fairly static, and uh, uncacheable, or infrequently cacheable. Um, another one, um, how many of you guys use query posts? To, for your loops or your homepage or whatever, um, that's actually doubling the amount of queries that you're running. So when you run to an author page or a category page, um, and then you add the filter of query post, you're essentially querying it twice. WordPress has already sent the post back. Query post is going to the database and getting the post you actually want back into. Um, there's a filter called, I think it's called rewrite that will uh, alleviate that. Um, so instead of query post, you just add a filter to rewrite, run a function, and filter out the queries that way. Really reduce the amount of overhead we were seeing. Uh, we had a home page. Um, we, have, uh, we had wanted to hide a, car uh, a category from uh, the home page or subcategory. It was not possible um, with with query posts, you really had to use this filter. Bear with me one sec, let me see if I can get this hotspot on. Any other questions? MySQL, GitHub, Scrum, Agile? Shoot them out, I'm dying here. Um, <laughs> you're, you're um, yeah, so thank you. If you're using the, if you're not going to use the, um, the nav menu, you know, to, to generate the, um, you know, use that function to generate your menus. How are you getting the styling that goes on kind of automatically for the, the drop? -down? Well, what I would, what I did, um, or what we do is, we enable the nav menu. We see what the structure prints out to be. Copy and paste the HTML result. Dump that into a HTML file, and then just include that HTML file wherever in header PHP you want your nav menu to be. So basically, create your nav menu using the WordPress. Yeah. Look into the source and find out um, find out what the resulting HTML is and the hard links, and then just dump that into a flat file and call the flat file in the header. But um, one one thing I've noticed is you get like the current page parent or the you know the, the yep. parent ancestor. So you we, you would kind of lose that if you use the static HTML. Or current like. parent. Um. So so. Visually, you're I might, be, uh, I might be styling my menu to indicate where I am. Oh, I'll yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you probably, you probably would use that. Um, there's JavaScript alternatives you probably okay. could use. I would stick it, I would put as much, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yep, I would, uh, I'm a proponent of sticking everything on the browser side. Let the browser do the work um, when you're creating a pretty vast amount of overhead by querying the server for that kind of stuff. So what's the um, what's the biggest site you guys manage? How many posts? Out of curiosity. 2300. That's big. You gotta look at that database to see if you can oh, yeah. something. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I've got a Friday ritual, 2.30, I'm cleaning stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 1100. That's big too. You're at the point where you're so starting to see any drag because of how big WP posted? Um, kind of, but it's already used. There was drag with an old uh, with a theme that we used to use that because we replaced the theme, the drag has disappeared. Ah, uh, yeah, some poorly coded theme or something that was adding a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, you know how in WordPress your themes all have like PHP and HTML all muddled in the same file? So if you're looking at author.php, there's PHP echoes in line on this page. 
Um, to avoid going through that, have you guys ever heard of Stamp? Which is, it's like a um, HTML generator where, um, it, well, it's a PHP class and you pass it certain variables and when you pass those variables to a template file, um, they're inserted appropriately without having to muddle any uh, PHP in line. So it's all valid HTML uh, comments, but without any of the inline stuff. Now this is, I'm just going to reboot here. Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit about what you guys do for CDN? CDN, yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, does everyone use W3 Total Cache? Or, yeah, that's probably that's my favorite plugin, hands down. Um, we use Amazon CDN. We set up um, it since we have so many images getting uploaded every day for each post or whatever. The Amazon CDN is on a pull uh, pull basis, which means. Um, so does everyone first? Does everyone knows what a CDN is? So I don't have to go into that. CDN is a content delivery network. So uh, when you serve when a visitor requests images, style sheets, JavaScript, they're actually communicating with your server. What a CDN will do will take those static things and serve them. Um, on a, from a different machine, and those machines can be geolocated. For example, with Amazon CDN, uh, hey, round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey. Just in time. Um, yeah, so the CDN um, will host various images or whatever you want it to host. Um, what we end up doing instead of um, Instead of telling Amazon, here are the files that I want you to host, um, the W3 Total Cache plugin with this is fantastic. You just tell it, uh, here's where I'm hosting all of my stuff. If there's a request from Japan um, for a certain image, the first request will go to our server to get the image. Then Amazon will take that image and host it on a machine closer to Japan. So the next time, uh, visitor from Japan comes to request that image. They're not going all the way to our machine, they're going to the content delivery network or the CDN machine, somewhere in between. It really helps offloading a lot of load um, and keeping Apache, which I won't get into now, um, light. Does everyone use Apache or is there any cowboys with Nginx up yet? No? I can't wait to try it out, but I'm scared. Uh, I don't know Russian either, so the documentation is pretty miserable. <laughs> okay. All right. And we'll get. Um, I'll start showing you some of those um, optimization queries I run over there. So yeah, like I said, uh, all of our page loads, the bottleneck was almost always MySQL, and anything we could do to reduce the amount of overhead on MySQL uh, was optimal. So here's um, how we monitor queries, and here's the paste bin. Um, so basically what you have to do is first in your WP config on your localhost, turn on save queries. It's just another def definition statement. Can you bump that font size a bit? Yep. Thanks. No worries. Better? So it's pretty straightforward. I just drop this at the bottom of my root uh, index file, index.php at the base. Um, and what did it do? What's it going to do here? Is first, um, I should reorganize this, but it'll take all the saved queries, WP DB queries, and for each of them, go through, assign it a number as to where it was run in order, the query itself, and how long it took to four decimal places. Um, from there, so we'll have a list of, I think our home page now has something like 120 queries. So you'll see a list of 120 queries. What this Amax function does is take the array of all those queries and find out which one is taking the longest. And undoubtedly for us, I always see it's something to do with um, WP terms relationships. Um, I've got to figure out how to reduce that one. If anyone's got any ideas, I'm all ears. Um, but yeah, um, this one, this one's a lifesaver. 
it can't hurt to add it to your, uh, the base of your file. And like I was talking about InnoDB, converting all these tables to InnoDB is a no-brainer, especially with MySQL 5.5. They've got this thing called, um, it's like an asynchronous library for InnoDB, meaning that any type of query to an InnoDB table, five minutes? Three. Three, okay, three, wow. Okay, um, the trick here with InnoDB, you gotta make sure you have enough uh, memory allocated to MySQL. So the basic rule of thumb is, how big is your MySQL table? One gigabyte. You've got to allocate 110% um, of whatever your MySQL database table is to um, your InnoDB buffer pool or something like that. I've written a blog post about that. Um, I'll, sh I'll put that and this uh, online somewhere so you guys can all have these queries and whatnot. Um, admin, admin Ajax, I went over that a little bit. Um, I would avoid calling it on page load, only call it on a neat event base, like a click, someone did something, then you call it. Um, you can afford the overhead, that one. Uh, here's the table float, um, another paste bin uh, link there for all you afterwards. Uh, the menu. Uh, so this is kind of what you were talking about earlier. What was your name again? I'm Brian. Brian. Um, so um, the nav header, instead of calling doing the same query over and over again, and it's never gonna be cached. Um, just throw it into the flat file, um, which we call nav header HTML or whatever. Um, what's really nice about this, the only downside is that anyone wants to make a change to the header, they gotta go through the development team, which uh, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'll make all those changes just uh, to, save the, um, to save the overhead on the queries. Um, now here's actually, this is actually getting a decent amount of attention. Um, the query post, uh, it's a filter on request and it's altering the query. The only uh, caveat here is um, you have to define what page you're looking for. So for here I'm looking for home. Um, the request comes through this function. We initiate a new query. We're parsing the um, request. And now I'm excluding certain category IDs. So one, two, they get uh, put into an array and then I just exclude those from the query. And on this function, it saves a ton of overhead. Um, any questions about this one? I think this is a really cool um, function that I'm hoping gets more attention. It's, there's a big stack overflow post about it, it's pretty good. Um, oh, and last thing, 3.4.1. Um, we just upgraded from 3.3. Uh, uh, the performance uh, kick is really nice. Uh, as you can see before our homepage, this was all, the cache was all primed. We were running 345 queries on the homepage. Since moving to 3.4, uh, that number has dropped by like 30%. Um, pretty significant. Working time is still uh, fairly uh, similar. But even just allowing MySQL to breathe for that additional 30% is really nice. And that is it. The last thing is um, we're hiring. Um, if you're a WordPress developer or JavaScript, HTML, CSS, PHP, or a Node.js developer and you're looking or know someone who might be a fit for a small team that's pretty agile, uh, hit me up. That's it. Thank you very much for bearing with me. If you've got any questions, I know I'm running a little over here, but uh, feel free to walk up and do whatever.